many eons ago, the great landmass of the southern hemisphere, Oceania, separated from the principal landmass. The harsh environment, which has kept humans at bay, has protected invaluable ecosystems as well as helping to preserve some of the world's oldest forms of life. This great continent floating in the remote southern Pacific holds the key that unlocks the secrets that first started life on our planet. South of the equator, a great coral reef spreads out some 2,000 kilometers off the northeast coast of Australia. This is the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest World Heritage Site on Earth. On what is a shallow continental shelf with water depths of only 20 to 30 meters, water temperatures are above 20 degrees Celsius throughout the year. The Great Barrier Reef is a large reef system containing more than 3,000 coral reefs. Dotting the waters around the reefs are many atolls with white sand beaches. Michael Mass Cay is one of the frequently visited atolls. More than 30,000 seabirds and migratory birds, including terns and seagulls, both live and breed exclusively on this island. The Great Barrier Reef is an important refuge for birds as well as fish. In waters which are only 10 meters deep, colorful fish live closely together with the coral. Corals live in tropical waters located between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. There are approximately 700 species of coral, of which 400 have been confirmed as living in the Great Barrier Reef. Corals are marine nidarians, a phylum characterized by creatures with small poisonous tentacles, including sea anemones and jellyfish. Nidarians are relatively simple creatures that eat plankton. They have bodies composed of a sac or polyp, a mouth, and tentacles. Coral differs from other nidarians in two ways. First, they live symbiotically with small plants to obtain energy through photosynthesis. Second, corals form and then live inside hard calcareous skeletons. Polyps create their calcareous skeletons as they multiply, forming large groups which eventually form coral reefs. Every November, on the night of the full moon, a mysterious spectacle can be witnessed on the Great Barrier Reef. These corals are releasing their eggs into the sea. Each polyp releases a gamete bundle, approximately 2 mm in diameter, which contains both eggs and sperm. Polyps release these bundles into the ocean one after the other. The sperm bags pop upon reaching the surface of the water and become fertilized with the eggs. 
These fertilized eggs then form tiny coral larvae called planula. Planula will float in the water for about a week before adhering to a faraway rock, where they begin growing into a polyp. Why the Great Barrier Reef formed in these particular waters is explained by the area's unique natural environment. Tens of millions of years ago, submarine volcanoes erupted one after the other in the tropical waters near the equator, and the sea bottom was heaved up. It is thought that coral reefs began forming in the shallow waters there about 18 million years ago. From these equatorial waters, the larvae of these ancient coral reefs then floated south along the north-south flowing East Australian current to the waters off the east coast of Australia. In these shallow warm waters, the coral reefs continued growing, eventually turning into a vast coral reef system 20 to 30 kilometers off the coast of Cairns. Some planula floated much further south along the current, forming reefs well off the coast. Indeed, the southern edge of the Great Barrier Reef is located 250 kilometers off the coast of Australia. Spread off the coast like breakwater, the reef is called a barrier reef. The Great Barrier Reef, the largest barrier reef on Earth, spreads out some 2,000 kilometers like a giant fortress in the sea. The calm waters within the barrier reef are protected from the winds and tall waves of the open ocean beyond the reef. In these well-protected waters, coral grows larger than in other places in the world. Acropora hyacinthus is a rounded species of coral that grows to approximately 2 to 3 meters in diameter. Due to its shape, it is referred to as table coral. With long branches more than a dozen centimeters in length, Acropora nobilis, or staghorn coral, ranges for dozens of meters. Ulophilia crispa grows to a diameter of three to four meters. This coral has elaborate two centimeter wide patterns on its deep green surface. Acropora monticulosa sticks out its cone shaped branches like fingers. Due to photosynthesis carried out by the coral, these otherwise nutrient-poor tropical waters have become rich in nutrients and serve as an ideal habitat for all kinds of fish. Indeed, today these waters here boast more than 1,500 species of fish, and the waters around the Great Barrier Reef are among the most ecologically diverse on Earth. The humphead wrasse, which is a species of parrotfish, grows as large as two meters in length. Due to its large protruding head hump, which is thought to resemble Napoleon's famous hat, as well as for its dignified air, the fish is also known as a Napoleon fish. This six-banded angelfish received its name due to the six bands of color found on its body. This fish can grow up to 50 centimeters in length, 
and is the largest species in the marine angelfish family. This bullet-head parrotfish crunches on the coral reef with its mouth, which resembles a parrot's beak. Fish inhabiting coral reefs tend to have colorful and elaborate patterns, like this butterfly fish. The reason for this is that these patterns and colors help them blend into the colorful reefs to elude predators. In addition to the hard corals, the Great Barrier Reef also has many soft corals and sea anemone, which are also part of the Nidarian family. There are also fish that live right within the sea anemone. This clownfish, which belongs to the Palmacentridae family of clownfish and damselfish, is 5 centimeters in length. A somewhat large fish, this is a barrier reef anemone fish, a fish endemic to these waters. There is a great variety of color and shape, even amongst fish in the same family. This twin-spot goby, which moves in an amusing manner, is a member of the goby family. The giant moray can grow up to two meters in length and inhabits crevices or cracks in the coral reef. We can also find various kinds of migratory fish that arrive in these waters along with the current including sharks, such as the white-tip reef shark, as well as dugongs and whales inhabiting the waters around the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef's unique natural environment has promoted the prolific growth of coral, resulting in highly nutrient-rich waters that support a myriad of marine life. The colorful world in which fish gracefully swim amidst coral reefs is one of the great splendors on Earth. Cairns, which is located on the northeast coast of Australia, is the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef and see some 800,000 tourists a year. Verdant forests spread out behind the city. Cairns is not only a gateway to the Great Barrier Reef, but a gateway to another natural wonder. Occupying an area of 8,944 square kilometers, the wet tropics of Queensland is a tropical rainforest that spreads 450 kilometers down the northeastern coast of Australia. Located on what is otherwise an extremely dry continent, the great forests of this humid region nurture many of the world's most precious plants, animals, birds, and insects. Rainforests were able to survive in this extremely dry land as a result of volcanic activities, which continued up till approximately 10,000 years ago. This resulted in the formation of numerous mountains. The only hint remaining to show that this area was once volcanically active is this crater lake on top of the mountain.
This entire area is influenced by moist air that has been warmed at the equator and blows in from the ocean year-round. This moist air bumps up against the mountains where it makes clouds, producing large amounts of rain. The region has an annual rainfall of up to 4,000 millimeters in some areas. The tropical sunshine and plentiful rain have cultivated vast forests, which over time have nurtured this wet tropics region. Wet tropics are defined as an area which has a year-round temperature of more than 18 degrees Celsius, as well as a high level of humidity. Unusual in the rainforest, we find tall coniferous trees growing alongside broad-leaved evergreen trees, such as acacia, as well as eucalyptus, which is native to Australia. Cowrie trees are huge coniferous trees which attain trunk circumferences of 6 meters and heights of 50 meters. These trees, which belong to the cedar family, grow only here and in one region of New Zealand. The trees in the rainforest grow most of their branches and leaves on the upper parts of their trunks. Because they look like they are wearing crowns made of leaves, this growth is called a tree crown. In order to gain as much sunlight as possible, tree crowns have grown one against the other, forming the forest canopy. While the tree crowns provide nests for birds and insects, they also prevent the soil around the tree from being washed away by keeping rain from falling directly on the ground under the tree. The rainforest floor soil, which was originally volcanic, is shallow and nutrient poor. In order to absorb what little nutrients are available in the shallow soil, the trees have adapted very large roots, called buttress roots, which spread outward around the tree. The buttress roots also help prevent the soil from being washed away by rain. In the rainforest, plants must fiercely compete for sunlight to survive. In order to do so, each plant has its own unique adaptations. King fern have grown in these forests for some 300 million years. This species differs from other species in that it can grow several meters in height with leaves that grow out of its trunk, similar to a tree. This is a climbing palm, which grows by entangling itself with other trees, like ivy. Sharp bristles cover the stems. Using these bristles, the climbing palm entangles itself with another tree to grow taller. There are many types of climbing palms, and many have their own uniquely shaped bristles. Since people often get tangled up in these bristles when they are out taking a bushwalk, the tree is called a wait a while. This is because if you get caught in one, it will take a while to untangle yourself. The ruffled fan palm is endemic to Australia. Its leaves spread out like a fan. Growing up to 20 meters in height, the ruffled fan palm is one of the trees that represent the rainforests of Queensland. A large basket-like plant grows in the upper branches of this tree. 
Known as basket ferns, these plants are aerial, formed and exposed in air. The spores, blown by the wind, attach to a tree where they grow, collecting rainwater in its leaves and obtaining nutrients from various sources, including bird droppings. Some of the largest basket ferns in the forest grow to two meters in diameter. Strangler figs are also aerial plants whose seeds are distributed in the feces of various small animals that eat its fruit. These seeds then germinate on the tops of other trees in the forest. This extremely resourceful tree extends its roots down to the ground where it absorbs nutrients directly from the soil. It is known as a strangler fig because it often kills whatever plant it has attached to by choking the other tree with its roots. This huge tree, which is known as a curtain fig, is said to be 500 years old. With its conifers and broadleaf trees, this rainforest nurtures a wide variety of animals. Because they mainly eat fruit, nuts and honey, these bats are known as fruit bats. This species of bat does not use biosonar or echolocation, instead searching for food with its large eyes. Rainbow lorikeets can be seen in most forests of Australia. This one meter tall flightless bird is called the southern cassowary. It is found only in this rainforest as well as in New Guinea. Due to the depletion of tropical rainforests, their numbers have been reduced to the point that they are now in danger of extinction. In addition to rainforests, there is a lava plateau called Granite Gorge, which has retained the same appearance over time. Basking in the sun are Mariba rock wallabies, which are small marsupials endemic to the area. Their diet mainly consists of eucalyptus leaves. It is thought that these animals originally lived in the forest, but migrated to this rocky area to avoid predators. The ecologically rich rainforest is alive with animals even at night. This possum, measuring 30 centimeters long, is looking for fruit and nuts between the trees in the dark night. Their numbers have been increasing due to their omnivorous nature. This bandicoot, also a marsupial, in the same family as kangaroos, is cleverly using its long snout to catch earthworms in the soil. The wet tropics of Queensland is the world's most ancient rainforest that accounts for only 0.1% of the vast continent of Australia. It is an irreplaceable treasure, nurturing many of the world's most precious forms of animal and plant life.
located approximately 450 kilometers southwest of the city of Darwin, in the northwestern part of Australia, is the Kimberley region. This is Australia's last frontier. The region, which is between 15 and 20 degrees south latitude, relatively close to the equator, has a tropical savanna climate. During the dry season, falling between April and October, the region receives little rain, with daytime temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius. During the rainy season, which falls between November and March, the region receives as much as 700 millimeters of rain. It is a harsh environment with only two extreme seasons. In 1983, a reporter wrote an article about some interestingly shaped gigantic rock formations in this area. This put the area on the map, and as tourists began to visit, it was designated as an Australian National Park in 1987. Geologists also turned their attention to the landscape, and their research uncovered some important and unique results for science, for both the makeup and formation process of these rocky domes, which then resulted in the area being designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2003. This mountain range is known as Bungle Bungle. The name Bungle Bungle was probably a corruption of the name of a common grass found in the area called Bundle Bundle in the local Aboriginal language. The rocky domes of the Bungle Bungle range are approximately 200 meters tall. beehive-shaped orange and black striped domes continue in four directions for 20 kilometers. The formation of the Bungle Bungle Range dates back in time by approximately 360 million years. It is believed that this area was originally a lowland dominated by mountains. Small stones and sand were eroded and washed down off the mountains by the heavy rains and deposited in the lowlands below. Over time, these stone and sand deposits grew larger, forming a thick layer. The stratum soon buried under the earth and hardened forming sandstone. This sandstone stratum later experienced geological uplift and was thrust back up to the surface, where it underwent repeated erosion from heavy rains, winds, and swollen rivers, which resulted in the uniquely shaped bungle bungles. Sandwiched between the crevices and gullies, which were also created by erosion, are many huge rocks, some weighing several tons. These rocks are believed to have fallen from the peaks above. Moving downstream along the dry riverbed, the appearance of the bungle bungles begins to greatly change.
In contrast to the area upstream, here we find a series of countless cone-shaped rocky mountains that appear like pincushions. This landscape was formed due to a greater proportion of sand and small rocks being washed downstream, where it formed particularly soft and fragile bedrock. Where the riverbed ends, one of Australia's largest deserts, the Tanami Desert, unfolds in front of one's eyes. In addition to the extensive erosion caused by plentiful rain, the hot winds blown in from the desert are also thought to have played a part in carving out these round domes. The domes have characteristic orange and black striped patterns. These tree ring-like bands were created by slight differences in the strata's mineral content, the effects of oxygen in the air, tropical sunlight, and a primitive form of bacteria. The orange layers are a result of scarce iron compounds in the stratum becoming oxidized or rusty in areas that have less moisture and dry out easily. Interestingly, the sandstone stratum has alternating layers of varying densities of moist and dry layers, every 10 centimeters or so. These different layers are a result of location and the age of each stratum. The black bands are the moisture-rich layers that are not prone to becoming dried out. In these wet layers, cyanobacteria, a bacteria that performs photosynthesis, quickly multiplied on the surface of the rock, where their repeated dividing and multiplying formed large colonies. The orange and black banding only covers the surface of the sandstone layers. When one examines cracked or broken spots in the rock, the layers can only be found several centimeters below the surface. Beneath the surface, there is packed and hardened white sand. Through repeated deposits, geological uplifts, and erosion, the Bungle Bungle Mountains took their current form approximately 20 million years ago. Along with their surrounding area, the Bungle Bungles are today preserved as Pernululu National Park. The name Pernululu means sandstone in the local Aboriginal language.
Scientific studies on the Bungle Bungle range began only 20 years ago. Already, though, the area is recognized as being as geologically and geomorphologically significant as Australia's Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, and the Grand Canyon in the United States. Scientific studies on the flora and fauna of the area are currently being carried out. The bungle bungles turn red in the morning sunlight. The gradual accumulation of sand and stones in the soil, along with the unique natural environment of the area, worked over some 360 million years to create these truly spectacular orange and black sandstone formations. The Bungle Bungle Range World Heritage Site tells within its rocks the lost history of the great land of Australia. Rough waves of the Indian Ocean pound against the cliff, sending up white water into the air. The Zuitdorp Cliffs located in the central part of the western coast of Australia, protrude out towards the sea. Many ships from Europe are thought to have crashed against these 200-meter-tall cliffs that extend down the coast for 150 kilometers. These cliffs, which were the bane of ships, function as a breakwater separating inlets and peninsulas from the open sea. In contrast to the rough waters of the Indian Ocean, the waters within the Great Bay, known as Shark Bay, are very calm. Inhabiting this Great Bay are many unique flora and fauna, including primitive creatures that tell the story of the Earth's history. In 1699, a British explorer who had come to these far-flung shores named the bay Shark Bay when he saw sharks swimming in its waters. The bay is quite shallow, with an average depth of only 9 meters. Even the deepest areas have depths of only 29 meters. A species of marine mammal, dolphins, swim freely between the shallow bay and the Indian Ocean.
wild dolphins have swum right up to the coast. There is a group of wild dolphins living in the waters around Monkey Maya that are thought to have made these waters their home, after the local fishermen began throwing fish to them some 30 years ago. Today, as many as 30 dolphins come up to the shore, where they have become so used to people that they take fish directly from their hands to eat. This type of human interaction with wild dolphins is hard to find in many other places on Earth. Within the tranquil bay, an area of seemingly endless indigo waters spread out in front of the eye. Exposed to plenty of sunlight in the shallow waters of the bay, seaweed grows plentifully. There are 12 different species of seaweed, including amphibolis, which affect the color of the water. Almost twice as large as Tokyo, with an area of approximately 4,000 square kilometers, these are the world's largest seagrass meadows. An animal that loves snacking on seagrass slowly makes an appearance while spouting water. This marine animal is a dugong, a creature which is said to have been the inspiration for mermaids. Dugongs, which grow up to 3 meters in length and 400 kilograms in weight, eat about 40 kilograms of seagrass a day. For this reason, they can only live in waters with an abundance of seagrass. Since they graze on the plant's soft leaves by tearing them off their hard stems, the dugongs leave a path of grazed leaves in their wake. Currently, approximately 10,000 dugongs are said to be living in the waters of Shark Bay. This number accounts for 10% of all dugongs in the world and is the world's largest concentration of them. Shark Bay is located in a subtropical region and has a moderate climate throughout the year. In the summer, however, there are hot, dry days with temperatures exceeding 35 degrees Celsius. It is also not unusual for water temperatures to reach over 25 degrees Celsius. These high temperatures cause massive seawater evaporation, and since the bay is extremely shallow, the salinity also greatly increases at this time of the year. Salinity particularly increases in the bay interior, where there are minimal currents. Salt concentrations are often twice that of normal seawater. Most shells, let alone fish, are unable to live in such salty waters. However, these waters are able to support the existence of other quite rare life forms. Glistening white beaches spread out as far as the eye can see. Looking closely, we find that this beach is not sand, but rather is made of billions of tiny cockle shells. 
These cockle shells are the shells of the carded cockle, a type of clam which is able to live in very salty seas. These shells are what gave the beach its name of Shell Beach. The shells have been accumulating here for the past 4,000 years, creating a white beach which is 7 or 8 meters deep and 110 kilometers long. Located deep within the bay, about 150 kilometers inside its mouth, is Hamelin Pool. At the water's edge, we find black stones covering the beach. These 50 to 60 centimeter long stones are stromatolites. Known as living fossils, they are what made Shark Bay famous throughout the world. Stromatolites are rock-like formations created by primitive microorganisms called cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are extremely small, measuring only between 1 one-hundredth to 1 one-thousandth of a millimeter. The organisms, which live in the sea, secrete mucus to trap sedimentary grains, which are then cemented together by calcium carbonate to form stromatolites. Stromatolites form very slowly, growing only about 0.4 millimeters a year. Oxygen is emitted from the exterior of the stromatolites. Cyanobacteria, which can live on the surface of these stromatolites in huge colonies, use sunlight to perform photosynthesis. There are more than 50 types of cyanobacteria living in the waters of Shark Bay, and stromatolite shapes differ depending on both the cyanobacteria species and water depth. Stromatolites first appeared on Earth about 2.7 billion years ago, at which time they began producing oxygen through photosynthesis. It is believed that 2 billion years ago, the Earth's shallow seas were covered with stromatolites. These stromatolites produced significant amounts of oxygen, transforming the planet into one where life could thrive. Through scientific studies conducted on stromatolites, it was determined that 850 million years ago, one year on Earth was equivalent to 435 days. It is not totally clear why stromatolites have been able to survive in Shark Bay to this day. However, we do know that the bay environment, with its high concentration of salt, supports the existence of these stromatolites and closely resembles what the Earth's environment was like two billion years ago. The phenomenal waters of Shark Bay were created by various overlapping environmental factors, which include the tremendous natural barrier of the Zuitdorp Cliffs, which protect the shallow, highly saline waters of the bay. Shark Bay is a natural treasure, which reflects in its blue waters both the Earth's history and the process of evolution. Cold and wet winds blow in along the coastline of New Zealand's South Island. This area is known in the native Maori language as Te Wahipu Nam, meaning the place of greenstone. Centering around the Southern Alps, which extend down the middle of South Island, this World Heritage Site boasts an area of 26,000 square kilometers. The area has one of the world's largest annual rainfalls, receiving 10,000 millimeters, and for some 200 days a year, it is either raining or snowing here. 
The wet and severe climate has helped ensure the survival of this pristine wilderness to this day. The Southern Alps are completely covered in a thick blanket of white snow, reminiscent of what much of the Earth must have looked like during the Ice Age. More than 100 very steep, 2,000-meter-tall mountains stand next to each other. The highest amongst these great peaks is Mount Cook, which has an altitude of 3,764 meters. The mountain is known by the Maori as Aoraki, the cloud piercer. These great mountains were formed as a result of the repeated collision of Pacific and Australian tectonic plates. The subsequent uplift continues even today. These mountains are indeed becoming taller by several meters annually. However, large snowfalls which turn into ice erode the mountaintops. Those areas with altitudes of over 2,000 meters receive 12 meters of snow every year. The accumulated snow is further cooled by the wind and compressed down into layers. These layers then form gigantic chunks of ice, compressed by their sheer weight. Taking on a belt-like form, the ice begins moving down the mountains. They have turned into glaciers. The glaciers, some of which are 300 meters thick, scrape the surface of the mountains. This erosion not only slows down the rising of the mountains, but it has also carved out what is a truly unique and stunning natural landscape. Currently, there are more than 140 glaciers in the Te Wahipu Namu World Heritage Site. One of the most famous glaciers is the Franz Josef Glacier. The glacier has a variety of shapes and views, and together with a guide, one can walk right on the surface of the glacier. Water flows on the surface of, as well as beneath the glacier. Even today, both gravity and the tremendous power of water propel this glacier from dozens of centimeters to two meters a day. The Franz Josef Glacier is said to be one of the fastest moving glaciers on the planet. This speed is one of the characteristics of the glaciers in New Zealand. At the foot of many of the mountains, we find valleys called U-shaped valleys. These valleys were carved out by deep glaciers which scraped away the mountains. Around 14,000 years ago, towards the end of the last ice age, when much of the Earth's surface was covered in glaciers, the mountains of Te Wahipu Namu were covered in thick glaciers, more than 1,000 meters thick. As the ice began melting, 
large amounts of water began streaming down the mountainsides, causing intense erosion. Seawater from the Tasman Sea flowed into this eroded coastline, slowly forming long and elaborate inlets called fjords. New Zealand's most famous fjord is the Fjord of Milford Sound. Going back 16 kilometers, the inlet is surrounded by towering 1,000 meter tall cliffs, which were also carved out by the glaciers. The large quantity of snowmelt and glacier runoff pours into the sea in the form of many waterfalls. The snowmelt from the glaciers, as well as the abundance of rain in the area, have nurtured what are the truly unique and ancient forests at the foot of the mountains. New Zealand used to be part of the same continent, along with India and Australia. However, it was separated from the continent by the movement of tectonic plates approximately 80 million years ago. During this time, New Zealand became completely isolated, and this isolation resulted in the preservation of the ancient forests. A variety of moss and ferns, primitive plants born approximately 300 million years ago, grow thick in the forests here. These plants were able to survive the Ice Age and have slowly continued adapting to their environment. Soft tree ferns, which grow to be 7 or 8 meters tall, are endemic to New Zealand. Rather than shedding its dead fronds, the tree fern adapts to the cold weather by forming a skirt of dead fronds around its trunk to keep warm. Today, the forests of Te Wahipu Namu are a precious storehouse of approximately 200 species of fern. We also find in the forests birds that are no longer able to fly. In this isolated habitat with no mammalian predators, birds have been able to easily attain food and therefore had no need to fly. The flightless takahe, a bird about 60 centimeters in length, eats nuts and ferns. It is a beautiful bird with a red beak and blue and green body feathers. Kiwi, which are also flightless birds, is the national bird of New Zealand. The kiwi is the only bird that has a nasal passage at the tip of its beak. A nocturnal animal, when night falls, the kiwi starts looking for its favorite snack of earthworms by cleverly using its beak. Unique penguins, called fjordland penguins, also inhabit these ancient forests. Here they make their nests in the same place every year, laying their eggs and raising their chicks. There are only 3,000 fjordland penguins in the world, all of which can only be found in this region.
In July, they make their nests behind rocks in the forest. Then, after the eggs hatch, the parents go and bring back fish to the nest for their chicks every day, until the chicks are ready to leave the nest around December. The fjordland penguin usually produces two eggs, and if both hatch, feed only the stronger of the two chicks, leaving the other to die of hunger. This is the way these creatures have adapted to the harsh natural environment. With its glacier-covered mountains and ancient forests and lakes, the pristine nature of Te Wahipu Namu, a place mostly inaccessible to humans even today, is a land that gives us a glimpse of what our Earth was like 100 million years ago. <laughs>